All right, why don't we get started with some of the housekeeping items. So thank you all very much for joining us today. I will have Dan introduce himself in one second. First, we'll just go through very quickly our housekeeping items. So anything you hear today is general advice. Dan and I obviously don't know anything about you. We can't offer any sort of personal advice. We would encourage questions, though. So it's a great opportunity to ask a question to Morningstar's global chief investment officer. So send through questions. We'll save some time at the end to, to go through some of those questions, but certainly get those in anytime you think of them. And you know, maybe to start out, we're going to talk a little bit, obviously, about investors today. We're going to talk about the market in general and some things that are happening. But it'd be great if you could give an introduction. I think a lot of people outside of the investment industry look at a title like chief investment officer and are probably wondering how you got into this position. What does that actually entail? So yeah, it'd be great, Dan, if you could just give a little bit of an introduction. Yep. Delighted to do that. Um, and hello, everyone. It's really wonderful to be with you today and to be here in Sydney uh, and be able to spend some time with the, with the team and, and, and speak to you all. So, uh, so yes, as, as, as Mark, as you said, I'm the global chief investment officer. So the chief investment officer at Morningstar is really responsible for our investment management decisions. So we have a team of about 90 people around the world, uh, many of whom are here in Sydney, uh, and they are running uh, funds and portfolios and taking all of our great research that we do around the world and really condensing that into portfolios for typically individuals that have financial advisors. And so we work mainly with financial advisors uh, and and help them provide investment solutions for their, for their clients. So that's a, a role I've been doing for a couple of years now before that. I was the uh, the chief investment officer for the EMEA region, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, uh, and I've been uh, at Morningstar since 2014. Okay, great. And I don't know, just what, and I know the answer will be they vary, but what is a day like? How much do you spend on markets? How much, I mean, what is it? typical day actually look like for you? Or maybe a typical week, some different things that go on? Yeah, sure. So a, 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 a typical uh, day or week for me will be really divided up into uh, spending time with our, our team. And uh, my focus there is to try and continue to develop uh, the way that we think about investing, uh, continue to develop our decision making, uh, processes. I'm obsessed with the way that people make decisions. And we'll, we'll bring some of that out in an investment context, uh, later on the webinar. But, uh, so I'm focused on continuing to, to improve how we make, um, how we make decisions, how we do research. Uh, and then, uh, part of the, the, the week is spent uh, talking to clients, talking to end investors, uh, and again, really trying to help them make their decisions as well and then explain what we're doing as part of the team. And then finally, uh, I get to do some investment research. Uh, I, I, just I, a little bit. Though. Just just a little bit. <laughs> uh, and that's you know, because I, I don't get to spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, that's why I don't directly manage portfolios anymore. In order to be able to manage portfolios at Morningstar, uh, you have to be able to spend a lot of your time uh, doing research uh, and spending time thinking about uh, the uh, not just where markets are today, uh, but more importantly, what are going to be the best opportunities in the long run and how we put those things together. I don't have enough time to do that well enough. Uh, and so I no longer run portfolios. I really focus on the team. Yeah, it's it's a problem in life, right? You get good at something and then you get promoted to a spot where you don't do it anymore. Yes. Well, anyway, <laughs> the exciting thing about today for me personally is number one, I get to learn from Dan, but also I don't have to talk. So I will turn it over to you. I know you've prepared a couple slides, mm. but obviously sending questions as mm. things come up that uh that you'd like to know about. So I'll just turn it over to you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Mark. And yes, please do send in, in questions. Uh, apart from anything else, it will give uh, people an opportunity for me to pause uh, and to <laughs> address the things that you want to talk about. So please do make sure you you do that. And uh, we may see some coming in already, which is which is great. Uh, the the title of the the presentation is investing in an uncertain world and that that's deliberate uh because although we feel like we face a lot of uncertainty at the moment the future is always 
uncertain. That's a characteristic of the future, uh, that we don't know what's going to happen next. And so what I want to do in the time we have available today is try and prepare you for whatever comes next. Uh, and we'll do that in a couple of different ways. The first is, I'm going to spend a little bit of time thinking about uh, how we should approach investment as investors uh, and some of the challenges that we face as investors uh, when we're making investment decisions. I'm ho hoping that's going to be useful to all of you. Uh, and then we'll move on to uh, from that to think about what's happening in uh, markets and uh, economies, some of the opportunities we're seeing uh, out there in the, in the marketplace. And the reason for that is to try and uh, to prevent you from being surprised uh, by whatever comes next uh, and trying to get your portfolios into, into good shape, not just for the new financial year, uh, but for everything uh, beyond that. So I've got a, a few slides, as, as Mark said, but please do uh, interrupt with your questions. That'll be much more useful if we know what you're, you're focused on. So let's, uh, let's start off then uh, with the, the concept that most people, in my view, have the idea of investment completely the wrong, wrong way around. When people think about investing, they tend to focus on markets, on asset classes, on percentage movements, on daily news. Uh, really, that's not what investing is. Investing is all about people. It's all about you. It's all about how you get from where you are today uh, to your own financial goals. And I've tried to illustrate that with this really quite cartoonish uh, <laughs> slide we have here in front of us. And if you think about where you are today, uh, you're that uh, you're that person uh, down there in the in the bottom left hand uh, uh, corner of the, of the of the screen, and you will be on a pathway to a financial goal. Uh, now, you may have really well-defined goals. You may not know what your goals are, but if you're investing, you are on a pathway to uh, a goal. And what you'll see here is there's a nice straight line uh, that misses the goal, uh, uh, but it uh, is labeled cash or near inflation. And one of the great challenges that we have when we're thinking about investing is that really what we would all like to do is just keep our cash in the bank uh, where it's uh, hopefully perfectly safe, provided it's a good bank, uh, and, and then just watch that interest accumulate over time, uh, taking no risk, uh, and then reach our goals that way. Now, in reality, unless uh, you are extremely wealthy and have quite modest uh, aspirations in life. Uh, you're not going to hit your goal by just holding cash. And so in order to reach your goal, you've got to aim for a higher return on your savings. Uh, and I, what you've seen here is I've drawn it initially as a straight line towards your goal, but then it's overlaid by this green wobbly line. <laughs> and the green wobbly line is the uh, emotional journey uh, that we all go on when we're investing because we know as soon as you start taking risk, uh, then we put ourselves at the mercy of the volatility of market prices. Uh, we know that uh, the price in the market is uh, determined not just by the long-term fundamentals of that asset class uh, or that or that company, uh, but it's also dominated by people's sentiment, how they're thinking about uh, markets, whether they're optimistic or pessimistic. And so what we'll see is that, and you're aware of this, of course, already, is that prices move moment by moment because uh, people are changing their minds. They're feeling more, more optimistic, more pessimistic. Uh, and so prices rise and prices fall. And when we uh, see prices rising, uh, we normally feel great. Uh, and that's where we have the more smiley uh, emoticons. Uh, and then when we see prices falling, uh, then that's when we tend to get, get concerned. Uh, and that's really the challenge for, for you as an investor. It's that as, as you're, as you're setting out on this journey, or you may be a long way along this journey, but as you're heading towards your goals, you are on an emotional Roller coaster. There are times when we'd be feeling great uh, and times when we'd be feeling terrible. And the times when we feel terrible are normally when we're surprised. Uh, and one of the, the great truths of investment uh, is that as human beings, uh, we tend to respond poorly to surprises. Uh, we're not built uh, for surprises. We are or oh, we're not built to, to ignore surprises, rather. Uh, we are all creatures uh, who, in our ancient evolutionary past, uh, had ancestors who responded quickly uh, to surprises. And we've inherited that through the generations. And uh, people who uh, immediately respond to surprises uh, tend to do very well uh, in uh, in the uh, the African savanna uh, or in the uh, in the the outback uh, in in Australia, <laughs> they tend not to do so well in financial markets, uh, and that's the great challenge we face. And the way that we respond to uh, to challenges 
uh, is is uh, is quite predictable. We'll come on to that in a in a moment. But before we do that, I just want to illustrate one of the the problems we have uh, with this these day to day uh, market movements of, of prices. And this is a, a study you can see here that was done by Richard Thaler, uh, who got a Nobel Prize, uh, and the quote is by Daniel Kahneman, who also got a Nobel Prize. You got two for the price of one here, two Nobel economists, uh, and they're both are saying the same thing, uh, which is the more you look at your portfolio, the more uh, likely you are to, to have a nasty surprise. Uh, and so what uh, Thaler observed here, you can see this on the left-hand side, is that if you look at your portfolio, and this is a portfolio just of, of US stocks, Thaler's a US economist, and we're really just thinking about uh, about, about company shares here. Uh, but what he uh, he saw was that if you look at your portfolio shares every day, uh, then you're likely to see a loss about 46% of the time. 46% of the occasions, you'll see, um, you'll see a negative day. And that prompts a surprise about half the time. So about, uh, if you look at your portfolio every day, about 46% of the time, uh, you will be suffering a negative surprise. Uh, Weekly, it's 43%. So again, very, very similar. Even monthly, it's 36%. So think about that, uh, that even if you look at your portfolio just once a month, uh, you'll get a nasty surprise, uh, one in three. And then even quarterly, uh, it's 30, 31%. And then yearly, it's 30. So what we can see is that, that the less frequently uh, you look at your portfolio, the less frequently you'll be surprised uh, but of course, uh, you need the discipline to avoid looking at your portfolio. And even if you have that discipline, you only look at your portfolio, let's say quarterly, uh, then you're still going to have a nasty surprise uh, almost a third of the time. So that's where these surprises come from. That's why we react uh, to these uh, to, to, to markets uh, because they surprise us fairly frequently. And here's the responses uh, that we all tend to demonstrate uh, when we are uh, when we are surprised. Uh, we either uh, try and fight our way out, uh, and you'll see, you'll see this in some people. Their first reaction uh, to uh, being surprised, they get very tense, very aggressive, and they try and uh, they try and fight their way out of the situation. Now, in investment terms, we tend to see that with people who then overtrade. Uh, so instead of uh, sticking to that long term path, they'll they'll start trying to introduce new things into portfolios. They'll swap from one manager to another, or one stock to another. Uh, and that's their fight response. Uh, that's trying to trade their way out of that surprise. And that can cause uh, real problems because people can become very short-term orientated and there's a chance of being whipsawed uh, of buying and selling in quick succession uh, and, and just keeping losing money every uh, every time we do that. Uh, the, the next is the flight response. And we see that in people that want to sell their portfolio, they want to get out of investments. Uh, when they're surprised, when they see a, a big market downturn, uh, they want to sell all of their, their holdings and just, just take the, 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 the surprise away, take the nasty feelings away uh, and go back into cash. But as we know, if you do that, you're unlikely uh, to hit your goals. And that's the problem with the flight response. Then finally, we have a freeze response. Uh, this is the, 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 the least de detrimental of the three. Uh, if you do nothing, that's better normally than doing something. Uh, but what it means is that you can miss out on genuine opportunities. If you think back to the COVID period, uh, we had times there when assets became genuinely and usually cheap. Uh, but if you're just frozen, uh, if you hadn't done anything at all, uh, then you'd have missed out on that. Say, that's not as bad as as the flight response or the flight response, uh, but it can be detrimental. And here's some examples that we see uh, illustrating uh, what happens. And uh, this is one for the for the fight response. Morningstar does this fantastic study uh, every year called Mind the Gap. Uh, and the purpose of this study, uh, as Mark knows very well, is to is to look at the difference between the returns that uh, fund managers report in their fact sheets uh, and the returns of the average investor. And the difference in returns uh, indicates mistakes that investors make in buying and selling that fund at the wrong time. And so uh, holding it when it's gone up uh, or buying it when it's gone up and then selling it when it's gone down and continuing to make that response. So it's a classic example of the fight response. Uh, and so I've just shown you here one table from that report. Uh, and this uh, table shows the, uh, the average cost of the fight response uh, when you apply it to allocation funds. Now, you'll know uh, that these are funds that are designed to, to not be traded. Uh, they're broad funds which have exposure to, to stocks and bonds, typically across the world, uh, and are designed for people to own them for very long periods of time. Uh, and you can see that because people um, uh, buy and sell these funds at the wrong time, 
in the 10 years to 2021, investors are costing themselves uh, uh, 0.77% per year in uh, in just buying and selling at the wrong time. That's the average investor. So some people will be much worse than that. Some people will be, be better. Uh, now, we as investment managers get terribly excited about trying to save a few basis points, a few hundreds of a percent in terms of fees or trading costs. Uh, and investors here, we can see, are cost themselves 77 basis points a year uh, just in their fight response. And so that's an example why the fight response is so detrimental. Because every time you take 77%, uh, 77 basis points off your return, you get a little bit further from your, from your goal. So that's an example of the fight response. Then we have the flight response. Uh, and this is uh, a, a terrible example that goes back to the financial crisis. And what it shows is what would have happened if you'd sold your, uh, your equity portfolio again at the bottom of the market, uh, and then either didn't reinvest, stayed in cash, uh, or reinvested just a year later. And you can see that if you started with $100,000, uh, back in uh, about 2000, uh, 2003, when the bull market started, uh, and then you sold at the bottom of the the the, the, the GFC crash uh, in uh, in the beginning of two thousand nine. Uh, instead of getting the, the 558000 you'd have had if you stayed invested, you'd have had only 162000 uh, which of course is the difference between someone reaching their goals and not reaching their goals. But that's very obvious because we know that the markets then rallied after 2009. So that's that's straightforward. But look at the red line. The red line here is what happens if you'd sold at the bottom of the market and just stayed out for a year. So this is a perfectly uh, a seemingly logical thing to do where you say, well, I'm just going to sell out until uh, until the dust settles, until the crisis is over. And you'll have seen that if you just sold out and stayed in cash for a year, uh, you'd have cost yourself over $200,000. Again, that's missing your goals. And this is the danger of the flight response, not just uh, that people get out and don't get back in, but people uh, but people get out and get in at a much higher price and lose um, all of the benefit that they'd have had from, from staying in. So that's the, 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 the flight response. That's the danger it has. And then finally, the freeze response. Uh, as I say, this is the least detrimental but what I've shown here uh, is some uh, is is the way that within the investment management team we measure uh, the opportunities in different markets, uh, and so I can uh, I can really dig in deep into this. Uh, but given the time we have, I'm not going to. I'm going to resist the temptation uh, and instead instead say that. Uh, the, the, the higher the, uh, the, the line. So you've got three lines there. The higher the line, uh, the more attractive the opportunity set is, um, to, to look for, for particular investments within, uh, within the broader marketplace. So we've divided there by, um, uh, developed markets. So, uh, countries like Australia and the, and the US. Uh, that's the dark blue line. And then uh, emerging market uh, countries like China, for example, in the light blue line. And then looking at different global sectors like mining or resources and, uh, or uh, banks and financial services in, in the gold line. And what I've, what I've sh- tried to show here is that if you go back to 2000, uh, then you saw that large spike in uh, global sectors and developed markets. That was a great time uh, to look for new opportunities. There's a, there's a broad opportunity set there. Whereas right now, we can see that within uh, developed markets, uh, the line is much lower. There are far fewer opportunities around. Uh, and so not a great time to be switching between one investment and, uh, and another. And that shows you over time how these opportunities arise uh, and, then, uh, and then go away. So before we get into thinking about markets and what's happening, I want you to really focus on uh, the way that you think about investments, on your own behavior. Uh, because if you don't manage to control that fight, flight, or freeze response, if you get surprised a lot by your portfolio, then you're likely to make uh, some really poor decisions, regardless of what's happening in the in the market. Now, I've spoken quite a long time there. Are there, are there questions we should we should address, Mark? Or do, you, or do you have any questions we should? Yeah, I mean, there there are a couple of questions. I I think for, I think because I know that you're going to talk a little bit about markets right now, I think maybe we'll hold off on the question. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I thought it was interesting that you consider a surprise when your portfolio goes down. Every time I look at it, that's what I expect. <laughs> so we have very different, uh, very different perspectives, but that's yeah. why you're the chief investment officer 
and I just host these webinars. Uh, you're a pessimist. That's a good thing. Um, where, uh, often, if, you, if you're not surprised by it, you, you illustrate that really well. If, you, if you're not surprised by that fall in the market, then you're more likely to make good decisions. Uh, but what we find is that so many people um, are um, uh, are surprised. If you can control that response, that's that's key. Yeah. No, I make bad decisions all the time. So I don't know. Maybe I'm an anomaly. But yeah, let's talk a little bit about the market. Then we can get into uh, we can get into some of these questions that have come through. Sure, absolutely. So let's move on to the the, the threats and the opportunities we see. And and I put a, a one of my favorite quotes there by uh, James uh, Carville, who was Bill Clinton's um, uh, electoral uh, strategist in uh, in his successful um, first presidential campaign. And it came up with a, the the slogan, which if you're old enough, you'll remember: "It's the economy, stupid." <laughs> uh, and it's uh, that's how Clinton won the election against against Bush. Uh, and really, when we think about the things that are likely to drive surprise, uh, the things that may lead us to make mistakes, uh, the, the, the key threats uh, that we see out there, it is primarily uh, driven by the economy. And so that's where I want to just spend a, a few moments uh, looking at the economy. Now, importantly, uh, we never make investment decisions uh, based on uh, what's happening in the economy. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a drawing, uh, too close a, a line between, uh, economic changes and what could happen, uh, to assets in a portfolio is normally a mistake. But when we're thinking about what could derail our portfolio, uh, what could cause those surprises, that's where we're thinking about the economy. And so that's why I'm bringing it up in, in this context. Okay. So, um, first of all, let's, uh, look at one of the big drivers that we've seen, uh, over the, the last few years. And that is the incredible strength, uh, in the U.S. economy, uh, particularly expressed through the, the jobs market. And when I'm talking about the economy here, I'm going to really focus on the, on the U.S. Uh, you'll tell Bob Max, and I'm not from the U.S. Uh, I'm from the U.K., so I'm not. I, I'm, not I'm not being um, uh, parochial in thinking about the U.S. It's just the fact that the U.S. is by far the biggest economy in the in the world uh, and drives so much of our perception of of the threats to the economy. And that's why uh, understanding what's happening in the, in the U.S. Is, is important. And you'll see here that obviously that was a big decline uh, around the COVID period, but we saw that incredible strengthening of the jobs market straight after that. Uh, and obviously, there's there's far more people employed in the in the U.S. now than there than there was uh, before the, the pandemic. So we've seen that great surge of income uh, that comes from people having uh, having jobs and, and employment, and that income's come through. Uh, at a time uh, where people are feeling much more confident about their future. Uh, and so you can see this reflected in the in the savings rate. So the proportion of people's income that they hold back. And so uh, you can see that uh, during that pandemic period, uh, as we all remember, we were locked at home. Uh, eventually, people got bored of spending money on Amazon. Uh, and so they were they were then the savings rates went up, they weren't able to spend money. And also, they were concerned about the future naturally. And so they were they were clamping down on, on, on spending. Uh, but as the economy's reopened, uh, as we've seen people's income surge, as employment has surged, uh, then we've seen that really sharp decline uh, in savings in the US. And now we're at a very, very low uh, level, 4.1%, you can see there, well below the average, uh, near the lows that we saw uh, pre the, the, the GFC. Uh, and so a very low level of savings. That means that spending, of course, which is the inverse of saving, is very, very strong. We're seeing that strength come through the economy. But it's not just consumers that are spending. Uh, here is the uh, the U.S. Um, uh, budget deficit. Uh, now you you remember if you're following the news that they we've just had this big crisis in the U.S. Uh, about uh, a borrowing cap that they that they have there that they just extended again. Uh, but you can see that one of the reasons they've had to extend the cap uh, is that. Uh, we've seen uh, a huge deficits in the U.S. as the U.S. government uh, responded to the pandemic. So we've had money that's been uh, flowing from uh, consumers. We've had money that's been flowing from uh, the government as well. And of course, all of that's been driven into, into companies uh, and companies are spending. Uh, and of course, because companies haven't really been able to, to keep up uh, with that spending demand, we've seen that sharp increase in uh, inflation. It's, uh, uh, the measure that's used is the consumer price index or CPI. Uh, and so we, we see it here uh, that that was that spike that we've all seen in the US and around the world uh, in terms of, of inflation. And what I want you to see here is that although a lot of people talk about uh, food price inflation, which we are 
definitely seeing every time we go for a coffee or buy a sandwich. Uh, people talk about energy price inflation. Uh, really, a lot of that has, has turned, particularly energy prices, uh, and that's the blue line. But core inflation, uh, so the um, the things that we spend money on day to day that don't fluctuate so much, that remains really high. And that reflects the fact we've had all this um, income uh, driving spending in the economy. Uh, and businesses have struggled to keep pace uh, with that uh, with that demand, and we've seen that uh, that really high level of uh, of inflation. And so, because of that, uh, we've seen the response from central banks around the world. Of course, it's been true in Australia uh, as well as in the in the UK and Europe. But you can see here in the in the US, uh, th this is the path of their uh, interest rate rise. We've seen a very very sharp interest rate rises uh, with a with a pause just last week. Um, uh, as we, uh, as, as the, the, the Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank kind of digests what they've done already. Um, but they've had to respond very, very strongly, uh, to this inflationary, uh, effect, which has come from, uh, spending. And so what we see is this buildup of pressure in the system. Uh, all of that spending has built inflationary pressure. Uh, that inflation has built, uh, interest rate pressure. Uh, and this has led to quite an extreme environment, uh, in the US. And so, although we've had all that spending, uh, we've had all of that um, uh, that uh, greater em employment. Actually, what we're seeing in the U.S. at the moment is very poor consumer sentiment. Uh, that that um, uh, that that uh, ri rise in very sharp rise in interest rates uh, as a response to inflation is leading people to be far more concerned about what the future future holds. And of course, as consumers become concerned. Uh, they uh, spend less, uh, and this is where all of those concerns about recessions are coming from. That as consumers spend less, uh, there's less profits available for companies. Uh, they typically retrench, um, and uh, the, the workflow, uh, workforce uh, reduces, uh, unemployment rises, and that's the that's the danger uh, that um, we could well see a situation later this year uh, where the U.S. goes from from great strength. Uh, into uh, uh, into weakness, uh, and if if that happens, uh, that's going to be a prime cause for those surprises that we're that we're seeing. And so the reason I'm showing you all of this is that you shouldn't be surprised if the U.S. goes into a recession. That doesn't change the long term future for your investments. It's going to cause some volatility. Uh, that might actually be a buying opportunity for some assets. Uh, but don't be surprised by recessions. These are perfectly normal uh, uh, normal parts of the uh, of the economic system. We're going to see periods through your investing uh, journey where there'll be periods of high growth and low growth of, uh, of, of, of great positive sentiment and recession. Don't be surprised by that. That's perfectly normal. Uh, don't let it blow you off course. Uh, this, is, this may well happen. And one of the other things to think about is that if it's well known that we could go into recession, uh, this is likely to be priced into assets as well. And so don't forget that if anything's widely known, uh, there's unlikely to be uh, an advantage in using that knowledge uh, to make investments. Okay, uh, and we can see that again reflected in uh, some uh, leading economic uh, indicators for the for the U.S. As you can say, uh, you see at the moment, this is now as low or almost as low as it was during that 2020 period. So this is a an expectation of what could come next. It normally corresponds with a recession. So there again, just adding uh, adding evidence that there may well be be a recession. Don't invest on this basis, but don't let it blow you off course. Okay, so uh, we're going to now move into uh, the impact on companies and valuations and start getting more into, into the investment mode and, and less onto threats and opportunities. But Mark, I just want to pause there again if there are any questions. Yeah, I mean, maybe this is a good lead-in question yes. going, in, going into this. And obviously, you know, I think people that attend these webinars and know Morningstar know that we're very focused on valuation levels. Yes. And the question is, how do you distinguish between good opportunities as a result of low prices mm -hmm. And something that is cheap for a reason. So a bargain basement price that doesn't indicate a good investment. So I guess a value trap yes. is how we would describe that. So I guess sort of philosophically, without mm. an actual example that the, the questioner put in there, how do you think about that? How do you distinguish between a low valuation that's a good opportunity and one that is there for a reason? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, again, a, a really great question and uh, and something I would happily talk for hours on. So you're going to need to rein me in if I kind of disappear off over the hills. And I'm ready to cancel the rest of my day. <laughs> Good, okay. Uh, well, for everyone else, just you know, whatever you have this afternoon, don't, don't worry about it. We're going to focus on valuation. It's cold uh, outside. Yes, at least in Sydney. Exactly. Uh, just 
pour yourself another coffee and we'll, we'll keep going. So, um, so uh, if we think about uh, the, the core of, of value-driven investing is the idea that there is um, there is a, an intrinsic value for an asset, uh, which is normally based on its future cash flow. So if you think of a, of a very stable business uh, that is not going to grow very much, and but will probably be there in 50 years' time, uh, unless they make some horrible mistakes, then we can we can get an estimate of what that uh, that profit stream is going to be worth over the next uh, over, over the next thirty years, let's say, uh, and then we can knowing uh, what that profit stream is going to be worth, then uh, we can we can say well currently the the the, va- the price of that asset is trading at, uh, above that fair value or below that fair value, and that's really our our guide as as you know in terms of of whether we think something looks looks attractive. Now, the more volatile the asset, the more difficult it is uh, to tell whether something is over or, un- or undervalued. And that's and that's where we have to be much more careful if we're thinking about assets uh, where um, there's a there's a lot of uncertainty based uh, baked in. So, energy companies, for example, uh, are more difficult to value uh, than a uh, than a, um, a food manufacturer yeah, in, in general terms. So, um, so there you have. Uh, there you have the the basics for for value investing, but uh, value investing is is based on the fact that you have a good idea of what that intrinsic value is. And so another way of saying that is that there's not going to be a fundamental break in the fair value of that asset. Now, what a value trap is is something where the future actually has changed, uh, where it doesn't reflect the, the 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 past. And so that's a that's a a really um, a really difficult situation for for any investor because if the if the future is going to look fundamentally different from the past, then your your model for valuation. Is is broken, and so when whenever thinking about investing from a value perspective, uh, we always need to understand uh, whether the the future is going to be fundamentally different from the past, and where it is going to be fundamentally different, where it's going to be worse uh, than it was in the past, where there's uh, where there's uh, threats to the future, uh, then that may be, well be a value trap. So what we do within the investment team is we look at what we call the contingent risks. Uh, what are the things that could um, cause this asset uh, to be less valuable in the future? So technological change uh, is, a, is a classic one. So uh, if you'd bought a uh, uh, a buggy whip company is the, is the example that people normally use uh, in, the, in the 1910s, 1920s, uh, then People were were not going to use whips in the future, uh, and therefore uh, that 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 investment was 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 intrinsically worth less. Uh, and so, uh, so when uh, thinking about the difference, really important to have a fundamental understanding of the of the business. The second thing is uh, that the, one of the mistakes that value driven investors make is they uh, they try and be too. Cute in their uh, too precise in the evaluation metric, and so that leaves you really to a uh, to be a, a hostage of fortune. Uh, really, when valuation uh, driven investing is at its most powerful, is when you're at the extremes, when sentiment is really uh, negative on a particular asset. So even if the future is not quite as good as the past, uh, you still have uh, or what we what we call a margin of safety. So you can afford for things to be to, to go wrong and still have a great investing uh, investment. So when when, when thinking about value traps or value investing, uh, uh, have that uh, spend time really understanding uh, the future for that business and how uncertain it is, uh, and then second, make sure you've got a big margin of safety before investing. Okay, I'm going to. We have another question that's somewhat related, yes. and then we can get back into the yeah, presentation. Yeah. But I'm going to change the question because I have very little power in my life. But this is <laughs> no, this is one, one thing, thing I can do. Excellent. Good, and I, I'm going to try to put the two questions together. Yeah. Basically, you know, you talked a lot about we can run into value traps if we are if the future is actually different from what we expect yes and or for for what we've experienced before yes do we have a risk now that you know for a while we've been investing in this low inflation low interest rate world yes. and now are we facing a different future where even if valuations have come down in certain types of securities or the market overall that yes. we're we're going to run into that problem and we mm-hmm. we heard this a lot when markets were dropping up last year, that everyone just said, buy the dip, yep. buy the dip, because that had worked. Mm. Every time markets went down yes. a little bit, you bought, they went back up. Mm. Are we faced with that issue, either the types of assets that will do well in this environment mm. or just 
I guess, the market overall. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, I mean, there's a few things there. I mean, I think the first thing I'd say is that whenever we're thinking about the, the future, it's really important to think about a, a range of possible outcomes rather than be uh, transfixed on, on one uh, possible outcome, one deterministic view of the future. So, uh, so yes, we need to think about what will do well in a higher interest rate, uh, potentially a higher inflation environment. We also need to think about uh, the reverse of that as well. So what happens if suddenly we go back to a, a, a low interest rate uh, environment? Um, so, so we need to think about, about both of those and how that, how you cope with both those in a portfolio. One of the reasons for having a portfolio is to be able to deal with uh, with various possible outcomes. But uh, you are absolutely right that some of the um, some of the assets that were uh, very expensively priced going into twenty two were expensively priced because uh, interest rates were so low. And so the way that uh, you you conduct a valuation on a, on a company, typically, and uh, forgive me if you already know this because I know you're enthusiasts uh, for <laughs> investing and you and you you uh, you read the, the the website and the the, work, the research that we do, uh, but you you tend to look at that stream of earnings, stream of profits I, I, I mentioned earlier, and then uh, to take into account the uncertainty of the future, you then discount that back uh, by a by a rate to reflect uncertainty. And what everyone uses for the the basic discount rate uh, is typically the, the the long government bond yield as a starting point. Now you you add a risk premium to that, uh, but you start with essentially an interest rate. Uh, and so when interest rates go up, uh, that discount rate increases. It lowers the value of future earnings and makes the asset intrinsically less valuable. And of course, it has a greater impact. On businesses where more of their profits are far into the future. So that's what we tend to call growth stocks, uh, where if you have what we had going into the pandemic was uh, companies that weren't making great profits now, but were expected to make great profits far into the future, suddenly if interest rates rise, uh, the value of those profits diminish uh, and the intrinsic value falls. And so in that situation, it may take a long time until those businesses get back to the the value that they were at, uh, or certainly a fair value uh, that they were at um, uh, before the before the the, the, the fall. So when uh, when thinking about um, how to deal with uh, with various uh, interest rate scenarios, one of the things that you need to be aware of is that growth companies tend to do less well. Businesses with earnings uh, that are really realized far into the future tend to do less well in a high interest rate environment. Uh, now, that, uh, that can impact cyclical businesses as well, but, but the, uh, the, with cyclical businesses, it's more just the, the change in business conditions rather than that fair value for the long term. Okay, great. Well, why don't we go through a couple more slides? Yes, and let's then, do that. Then I've got some very specific questions for you. Okay, then we'll we'll dive into that. Uh, right, we're we're uh, thirty seven minutes past the hour, so I'm gonna we'll take a yes, yeah, couple more slides, and we'll we'll dive into some of those more specific questions. Brilliant. Okay, so let's think about profits and valuations, which clearly is what we're buying when we're making investments. So here you can see uh, the uh, the uh, earnings, the profits uh, from uh, U.S. businesses, uh, and you can see again that very sharp climb in profits uh, that we saw as everyone started spending money. Uh, the government's individuals uh, post the, uh, the onset of the pandemic, uh, and we saw very, very sharp profits, which supported, um, in many cases, higher valuations. Um, uh, and we saw that sort of large post-pandemic spike. But more recently, uh, we've been seeing profits come down in the US. Uh, and again, they haven't come down sharply, which is surprising given the level of inflation we've seen. And what that indicates is that companies have been able to pass on those price rises to, to consumers, which again, we're all seeing in our, in our sandwiches and our coffee and everything else we buy. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, earnings are, are less, less strong. And, and quite often, uh, that's an indicator uh, that there's some, some trouble ahead because the, the weaker earnings are, then the lower, uh, again, the price people are prepared to pay for, for those earnings. Uh, and you can see that again in the uh, in, in the, the performance of of uh, U.S. equities uh, as well. That uh, we saw that that big fall I mentioned 
uh, when people were concerned about the long-term value of particularly technology stocks uh, in 22. There's been a been a recovery uh, this year, and that's been particularly driven by a very small number of um, stocks in the what we call the communication services space. Uh, so companies like Meta that owns Facebook and NVIDIA, uh, the, the chip maker, which is based on what's happening in AI. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we've seen some level of, of recovery there. We've seen some optimism return, but there's still some nervousness about uh, about what's happening with profits. But when we look at valuations for the market as a whole, they don't currently look that extreme. So we're used to the US uh, being uh, a very expensive market. But if you look at uh, this measure of valuation in the, in the US, and this is a, a preferred measure of many people. It's called the Schiller uh, PE. I, I mentioned Robert Schiller, Nobel laureate, uh, earlier in the presentation. Well, he also derived a way of valuing uh, companies that takes into account uh, the fact that the economy is is cyclical. Uh, and so this measure of, uh, of uh, valuation uh, irons out uh, the, the the cyclicality of, of the economy and looks at average earnings rather than just the last 12 months earnings. Uh, and you can see there that although there's been many peaks and troughs, uh, we're, j- we're just a little bit above uh, the average since 1990. So certainly US stocks don't look cheap at the moment, uh, but they don't look as extremely overvalued as they did going into, into 22. And so that's something to, uh, to remember as well, that when we're, we're thinking about, about investing, uh, although you could see values come down if people are surprised by nasty economic conditions, it's not a, it's not a terrible starting point uh, for investing right now in the US. There are, there are more attractive markets around the world uh, certainly, but it's not a uh, it's, it's not a bad time uh, to to invest, and that is also known just because I drone on about it. The Cape ratio, yes, as well. So maybe I just don't give Schiller any credit. I guess we're in a fight, well, at, or something like that. But anyway, I always say Cape ratio, but yeah. just so people know that it's the same thing. It's the same we're talking thing. About. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you did mention AI, and we have yes. a question from Jane yep. about AI. And you know, the question is, and maybe you could just speak about it more in general. But how will AI disrupt? particularly for people approaching retirement. But, you know, you talked about NVIDIA and how well it's done. Yeah. But how do you look at AI? You were talking about investors need to look at potential changes that yes. are going to happen in technology is a big one. Yeah. I mean, how do you and the team view AI, if at all, yeah. I guess, when you're making investment decisions? Yeah, absolutely. So, so as, as, uh, I've been thinking about AI for quite a long time, and, and I'm I'm really influenced by some of the work done by um, uh, Gary Kasparov, who was, uh, people remember, the world chess champion, uh, who was famously beaten uh, by a computer, Deep Blue, in 97, uh, and has written an incredible book about uh, chess and, and AI for, for people like, who like that sort of thing, which I do. Uh, and uh, the, if you look at what's happening in, in the chess world now, um, the, the people who are winning what they call open tournaments, where, uh, the, the chess player can be assisted by a computer. Um, the, 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 the best players accompanied by the best computers are winning all of the, all of the tournaments. Uh, a, a, a chess grandmaster without a computer is not winning. Uh, the computer on its own is not winning. Uh, what, what's winning is, uh, that combination of a, a human being who can exercise judgment, uh, and a computer, uh, that can make many, many calculations very quickly and reduce some of the biases, uh, that we see in human decision making. Uh, and, and that's very much the way, uh, that, um, as, as we think about in, in investing. And as many other people think about investing, uh, we're thinking about how do we combine, uh, the, the judgment that comes from deep research, uh, which AI is not currently able to do, um, versus, uh, or alongside, um, the, the best quantitative models to try and deal with the biases that we, that we all have, uh, and to, to, um, allow us to process enormous amounts of, of data. So it's, it's always hand in hand. Now, as we, as we look at that, what does that, what does that mean? Well, it, it firstly, it means that from an investment perspective, although we've heard about, uh, AI, um, uh, being very successful in, in certain Field. So there was um, uh, some recent drug discovery that was done with the help of, of AI. Uh, that's that's really um, operating what I'd call a, a closed environment. 
The challenge with investing uh, is that it's future orientated, uh, and everything that is uh, that is in the future is by definition uncertain and, and open. Uh, and so, I think it's going to be uh, a little while before um, AI can replace uh, anybody who's uh, in a, a judgment based occupation uh, that requires them to, um, to 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 deal with. Um, what's happening in, in the future or to deal with uh, a broad range of, of circumstances. And we can see this in some of the challenges with autonomous driving uh, as well, uh, that um, the, the, uh, the, the number of scenarios uh, that a, a computer has to take into account to make that work, uh, something that is very simple for a human being, uh, or relatively simple after we've had a few lessons. Uh, but but we, we, there are things that we do very simply uh, that are very, very complicated for a computer and, and vice versa. And so I think the, the, the future as I see it is that although it will be disruptive to some business models, uh, we need to be aware of that. Uh, it's, it's going to be less, uh, disruptive to, um, uh, to, to job roles, uh, where people, uh, have to, have to use their, their judgment. Uh, roles where we're sort of replicating the role of a, of a, of a computer are, of course, more challenged. Um, but, uh, that, that then leads on to thinking about education, how we prepare people, uh, for those, those roles in the future. Yeah. And we do have a, uh, we do have another perspective mm-hmm. by a viewer, Rodney. He yes. says, when the computers and robots kill us all off, we won't have to worry about the performance of the market. <laughs> well, that, I so, mean, that is absolutely true. Yeah, that something is to, irrefutable. Something to keep in mind. Okay. Yeah. So we've got a, we've got a question from Don. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it is very Australia specific, but probably we can expand this globally. So Don says in Australia over the last decades, there has been a massive growth or there has been massive growth in government spending mm-hmm. as a share of GDP. So given this huge spending by governments and a significant decline in the share of the private sector Mm -hmm. spending, I assume, how is this going to affect the economy and shares? And maybe what what Don is talking about, you know, we have seen in Australia, given obviously the tax incentive to pay dividends, there are there is some worry that companies are not investing enough in the economy and expanding the company. They're just shoveling out dividends to uh to shareholders. And, you know, we heard the same thing in the US, right? With yes. share buybacks instead yeah. of dividends. So yeah. is this, does this concern you that we've had this change in spending um, between different players in the economy? Yeah, I, I think so. So one aspect of that is a, is obviously a political question in terms of what do we believe is the role of the, the state versus the role of, of private enterprise. Uh, and uh, and that varies by person by person and party by party um, and country by country. And so, uh, so yes, there's been a, a change in um, uh, recently in, in the um, the economic viewpoint uh, where people moved away from worrying about deficits uh, to believing uh, that deficits didn't matter anymore. Um, I I actually don't accept that. That view, um, I believe that deficits are important. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very complex issue. Um, but the, um, uh, the, the, the discipline that comes from caps on government spending are, are, are probably good in terms of, um, making sure that, that taxpayers' money is, is spent well. And then you get into the, the conversation about, well, where should we, where should it be prioritized? Um, what should be those caps and, and which, uh, stripe of government, uh, does it better? And so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to, to debate around the dinner table. But, um, when we're thinking about, uh, companies investing, uh, one of the, one of the great challenges that we face as investors is that companies often don't make good use of their cash flow. Uh, so if you think about the success of Warren Buffett that everyone would have, would have heard of, uh, one of the, the great advantages he has over other investors is that he gets to control what happens to the cash flow that these companies generate. Uh, and so in some cases, he can reinvest that cash flow it back into those companies, uh, where he sees got good opportunities. Uh, but, uh, he can also take that cash flow away and reinvest it elsewhere. Now, people operating in public markets can't do that. Uh, and even if you're buying into, let's say, private equity funds, you don't get to control the cash flow that uh, the, 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 the private equity um, managers do. 
And so being able to control that cash flow, being able to distribute it uh, to different opportunities is a massive advantage. And what that says is uh, that most businesses don't do a great job uh, of managing their their reinvestment. Um, and uh, some do better than, better than others. But one of the, the things that people will have seen on our equity research notes is that we grade companies uh, by how well they manage their, their, their capital allocation. And that is that is absolutely key. And so I, I think the um, there's there's definitely an issue around investing in the uh, in, in the economy uh, and uh, preparing for, for for future growth versus um, paying back capital. Uh, but nevertheless, we have to be uh, alive to the fact that most companies don't do it well, and so uh, maybe the money is better in the hands of investors who can deploy it elsewhere than it is in the hands of company management. All right, so. A little bit of a challenge. Yes. Challenging. It's not a challenging question to answer, but maybe a little bit of a challenge for what okay. you do every day. Yep. So Peter says, why not hold global index ETFs with low admin and dump active funds with high fees? Yes. Uh, so um, firstly, I absolutely agree that you should dump active funds with high fees and dump passive funds with high fees as well. Dump everything uh, <laughs> if the fees are too high uh, to justify the skill of the manager. Uh, and I'm using high fees there in a relative rather than an absolute context. And I mean relative to the ability of the manager to add value. Uh, so a, uh, a, a manager with a proven ability to, to do that uh, and is operating in an environment that supports uh, adding value, uh, a, 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 an easier environment for, for an active manager, uh, then uh, they may uh, they may be worth a higher fee. Uh, equally, if you have a manager in a in a in a poor environment for adding value uh, that is uh, that has um, less skill, then absolutely you should dump them. And, and if you if you look at our manager research, our fund research, uh, you'll see that's exactly the approach uh, that we take. So we are completely aligned uh, with dumping those managers. Um, the the question around why not just buy a global um, ETF though is is one where we may not be. Uh, aligned. And so I, I, we use ETFs in our portfolios. We use a lot, a lot of passive funds in our portfolios. Uh, but the challenge of, uh, of buying a, uh, a just a, a global ETF. Uh, is that uh, at certain times uh, you could get a well diversified portfolio uh, at, at, at good valuations, but at other times you end up even at, with a global level with a concentrated portfolio uh, with uh, in in very uh, uh, richly valued uh, stocks, and so that is unlikely to give you a uh, a great return over the next. Five to ten years compared to uh, more of a valuation-driven approach. We know that over a five to ten-year period, valuation really matters uh, when it comes to returns. Valuation doesn't matter if you're going to own a fund for thirty years. Over that time, all the valuation ups and downs wash out. And so, if you're going to, if you promise not to sell it, uh, if you owe, if you're going to own it for thirty years, you can pretty much guarantee it. Then it's a Pretty good thing to do. Most of us don't have that sort of patience, don't have that sort of investment time horizon. And so over a five, 10 year period, uh, then there are times when it's better uh, to own um, uh, own uh, better valued uh, companies. And what we're looking at in, at a global level at the moment is a dominance by the, the US market, as, as you know, and that makes up a very large portion of, of, the, of the global um, global market. And then within that, uh, you've got dominance uh, by technology companies and really a very small number of technology companies. So although you may feel like you're globally diversified, actually you've got concentration in quite a small number of, uh, of richly valued companies. Uh, and so I actually think at the moment, uh, it's, uh, active managers have a, a, a much better opportunity set uh, than uh, than they have done over the last decade as those levels of concentration have been building. That doesn't mean that active managers are going to outperform uh, straight away. It doesn't mean that uh, expensive act active managers will uh, will outperform the, the cheaper ones or, or passive funds. That's really important to focus on costs. But we're in a better environment for active managers uh, than we've been, for, we've been for a while. Okay. And it's interesting. We actually, you know, you obviously said this, so I'm not going to ask it to you, but Phil wrote in and said this sort of AI surge and particularly big cap US tech stocks yes. has distorted the market. So if you're like me looking to invest in the US via an ETF, he listed a couple, but basically yep. S&P 500 yep. 
ETFs, it doesn't really look like an obvious buy-in opportunity. So you and Phil are on the same page. Yep. Phil and I are, are on the same page. And, and I think that's, it, it's again, one of the most important things in investing is to understand what you own and why you own it. And so if you, if you own a, a global ETF for diversification, then make sure it's diversified. Yeah. Uh, if it's concentrated in stocks, it's not doing the job you want to do. All right. So last question. Yes. And this is a question just about you. Yep. So what have I assume you invest personally as well as professionally? So uh so good point. So I have what I call a mistake account. Uh and so I have a a, a very small portfolio uh which I use to to make my mistakes in. Um all of my um my retirement money uh is run by our CIO in the in the UK, um, a chap called Mike Coop, uh in uh in the same fund, in the same share class uh, that anyone else can access. Um I believe really passionately about uh as investment managers, we should eat our own cooking, as we as we put it. Uh and so 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 um all of my retirement money uh is is with with Mike, all of Mike's retirement money is in the same pot, uh, along with other folks in uh, in uh, London as well. Uh, and that's uh, and you know around the world, people own 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 our own portfolios. And the uh, the the importance there is that I want to spend my um, my thinking time about investment supporting our clients and not trying to develop ideas for for me. Now, now and again. I'll have a, 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 a an investment idea which is just not suitable uh, for our portfolios, and that goes in the mistake account, and that keeps me humble. Uh, but um, all of the all of the important money is run by Mike. So this must be interesting when Mike comes into you for his performance review. So you did a terrible job this year, and you're ruining my retirement. <laughs> exactly right. So yep, uh, spot on. You know, we uh, we we sit together, uh, and so he, he ends up sitting next to, to one of his clients, which is a good thing. But but I think the um, but that's right. The uh, you know just an aside there. Um, really important to separate out the quality of the decision making, uh, which is how we judge our portfolio managers. Uh, rather than very short term returns. So we, so we do align our portfolio managers to longer term returns. Um, but yes, Mike is pretty safe, uh, that I'm not going to blame him for the latest bit of volatility in the, in the market. Okay. Great. So I think we are going to stop there. Yes. We have a couple more minutes. I've got a webinar in case any of you guys are going back to back, mm. which I feel sorry for you. If you're doing that. I've got a webinar in four minutes that I need to run to, but. Thank you very much for joining. I really appreciate it. It's great to hear your perspective and thank all of you for joining. There were a couple of questions that were like very specific about individual tobacco stocks and Invocare, which is a funeral home operator in Australia that I thought you probably didn't spend a lot of time on. So I cut those out. I would not do this. But if somebody wants to email me those questions, I can point you towards the research. It, of course, won't be my opinion. Um, so just send those through to my email address, which is in the invite. But anyway, thank you very much for joining. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I, it was great to be here. And, and thanks, everyone, for, for joining online. And Phil says a very interesting discussion. <laughs> thank you, Phil. I there really appreciate go. that feedback. All right. Thank you, everyone. This video has been prepared for clients of Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or New Zealand Wholesale Clients of Morningstar Research Limited. Any general advice has been provided without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.